Well, welcome back. We are in week two of a new sermon series that we actually started three weeks ago uh, called The Kingdom. And in this series, we're going to be exploring what the kingdom is, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and how we as Christ followers partake in this kingdom. It's my hope that through examining the scriptures together, that throughout this series, that we will have a better understanding of how we can be a part of God's kingdom here on earth as well as how we can prepare ourselves for being a part of the kingdom of heaven in eternity when Jesus returns. But before we dive in today, I want to start from a place of prayer. So if you would pray with me, I would appreciate that. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that we have before us. Lord, these are your words and not mine that we read today out of Scripture. So Lord, may you move in our hearts through them. Stir within us what it is that you desire to stir. Lord, may we be open to the moving of your Holy Spirit here in our midst as you seek to change us to reflect you more and more. Lord, pray that you would open up our ears and soften our hearts that we would hear your word clearly. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, one of my goals as a pastor and as a person is that I would be someone who's fairly well-read. I like books. I like to read them. I like to collect them. In fact, my wife has told me many times that I should stop buying books because I have enough and I haven't read them all, which one of my professors one time told me, well, just tell your wife that it's not your book collection, it's a library, and nobody's read every book in the library. So since then, I always tell my wife, what's well, my library? And if anyone ever wants to borrow books, come and find me. I'm happy to lend out my books to you. But one of the things that I've been trying to do is to read in different genres, not just read Christian living books or theology, but to branch out a little bit and to see what else is interesting to me. And I just finished a book a couple weeks ago that was something that I had not read before, and it was a book called Into Thin Air. And it was by John Crowker, who is a writer for Outside Magazine. And John details his experience of climbing Mount Everest in 1996. Now, what was unique about this was at the time, this was the deadliest season on Mount Everest ever. He was a part of a team that on the day that they sought to summit, their team alone lost four of their members, and eight people died that day on the summit, which was not a normal occurrence And so the book details their preparations for this journey for climbing Everest, the amount of effort it takes, which I think most of us would assume it takes quite a bit of effort to climb the largest mountain in the world, but I had no idea what goes into it. The amount of training that they endure, the sickness that they have to wrestle with, almost everybody on the team getting sick throughout their hike up, the time that this took. From when they get to Nepal, it takes about three months to summit the mountain and get back down. It's not a short journey. And not only that, but the cost is significant. At this time, most guides charge upwards of $75,000 for someone to summit Mount Everest. And you need a guide to do it. Someone who will help guide you up the trails and show you where you need to go and how to stay safe. And most people use oxygen as well to get to the top. Yearly, about 800 people attempt to climb Everest, which totally caught me off guard. I did not expect that many people would go through this suffering, would endure these hardships, would spend that amount of money for one shot. And the reality is, on your day to summit, if something goes wrong, if you don't make it, you don't get to just try again the next day. That was your shot for that trip. And so there are people on his trip who had been within hundreds of feet of the summit years before and didn't make it. And so they were trying once again to make it to the summit. But these people have determined that the sacrifice is worth it, that the cost is worth it. The journey is not for the faint of heart, not for the weak, and not something to be entered into lightly. In a similar way, Jesus, in our text today, wants to make a distinction that becoming his disciple is not for the faint of heart. It's not something to be entered into lightly. He tells three parables in Matthew chapter 13 that show the importance of us considering the cost to become a follower of Jesus. So let's take a look together. If you would open up your Bibles to Matthew 13 or follow along online or it'll be up on the screen as well. In the 13th chapter of Matthew, we see many references and teachings related to the kingdom of heaven. 
Multiple times, Jesus teaches about this fact through parables. And this should cause us alone to pay more attention. The fact that Jesus speaks about the kingdom so often should make us stop and pay attention to what Jesus is saying and the internal significance to what it is that he says. And there's three parables that we're going to be looking at together today, which are fairly straightforward. They're not hard to understand like some parables are, yet in spite of being easier to understand, they can be difficult to follow and to live out. So starting in Matthew chapter 13, our first parable is one verse, verse 44. And this is what Jesus says. He says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy... He goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. The kingdom of heaven, this main theme that we've seen throughout chapter 13, Jesus once again returns to the topic, this time through a parable, and compares the kingdom of heaven to a treasure hidden in a field. Now, remember, when we studied parables before, just to remind us that parables are meant to convey a truth. Not every aspect of a parable is necessarily true or holds significance beyond the word itself. We also have to be careful when we read parables to not read into it what our desires are, our own agendas or our hopes, but to take them as they would have been presented in the culture of the day. And so Jesus here is showing the great value of the kingdom of heaven, such a great value that he compares it to a treasure hidden in a field. Now, I don't know about you, but when I have any valuables, not that I have many, I don't hide them in my field or in my yard. I put them in a bank, I put them in a safe or a safety deposit box or one of those lock boxes I store in my house, somewhere where I feel like they are safe and secure. But in Jesus' day, there weren't banks that you could just go get a safety deposit box at and put your goods at, your valuables to protect them. You couldn't order a safe off Amazon and secure it to the floor in your closet. You had to come up with other ways to secure your valuables. And people had to secure them personally. This led people to keep them in their homes. And when there was a threat of thieves or invading armies, what people would do is they would bury them in the ground for safekeeping. Often they would place them in in clay pots and bury them in the ground so that when the armies came in to conquer the village, they wouldn't get all of their valuables. The Jewish historian Josephus talks about the aftermath of Jerusalem's destruction by Rome in AD 70, and this is what he says. He says, No small quantity of riches that had been in that city were still found among its ruins, a great deal of which the Romans dug up, but the greatest part was discovered by those who were captives, and so they carried it away. I mean, the gold and the silver and the rest of the most precious furniture which the Jews had, and which the owners had treasured up underground against the uncertain fortunes of war. So when Jesus speaks about a treasure being hidden in a field, this wasn't something that people wouldn't have understood or would have thought, well, that's an odd thing to say. They would have thought, exactly, that's what we do with our valuables. That's what we do to protect them and to keep them safe. Jesus continues in the parable saying that the treasure is found by the man and then covered up once again. And I think in our day and age, right away we tend to think, well, that wasn't that honest of this man to find this treasure in this field, to dig it up, and then to bury it again. Wouldn't the right thing be to go and contact the landowner and let him know, hey, I found treasure on your land? But that wasn't the case during Jesus' day and age. New Testament scholar Craig Blomberg states that today we say that possessions is nine-tenth of the law. In the first century Israel, it was virtually ten-tenths. In fact, according to the Jewish rabbinic law, if a treasure was found directly outside your doorpost on the ground, it was not the rightful, um, it wasn't the rightful law that the landowner would own that treasure. If you dug something up outside the home, it was the person usually who discovered it, who then had possession of it, who then could own it. So this man in the parable who digs up the treasure doesn't just take it. He doesn't just leave with it, but he buries it once again, covers it up. In the next sentence, Jesus shows us how he handles finding that treasure. In his joy, he goes and he sells all that he has and buys the field. Rather than just taking it, rather than just fleeing with this treasure, the man leverages 
all that he has to purchase the field and thus digs up the treasure again and possesses it. The treasure is so valuable that this man does this in joy. He chooses of his own accord to use his resources, to leverage all that he has to buy this field. No one told him he had to do it. No one said he must do this. But he chose of his own accord to do this because of the great value of the treasure that he found. And while this man found the treasure in the field, in the very next verse, Jesus moves on to another parable about a man who's searching for treasure. Look with me at Matthew 13, 45 through 46. And Jesus says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. So in the second parable, the second short parable we have here, the focus continues to be on the kingdom of heaven. But unlike our first parable that just had a a random man as the main figure, this one has a merchant as the main character. And this merchant is in search of fine pearls. He's trying to find his treasure. He doesn't just stumble across it in a field or have to be digging in the field and find it, but he is intentionally searching for treasure. The difference is obvious in this one. He is in pursuit of something, while the other just seemed to happen upon it. But both of these men find something of great value. When they arrive, how they arrive at that treasure is stated differently, though. Well, as I was reading through these scriptures, I thought, well, I know that pearls have a value, but what kind of value did they have in Jesus' age? Like, pearls are a lot more obtainable now. I imagine that they were a little bit more valuable, perhaps, in Jesus' age. So I did some research to try to figure out what I could about pearls so that we could understand this parable better. In Jesus' days, pearls were considered something of great value. In fact, they were considered to be the ultimate status symbol in that day and age. They were so valuable that in the first century, Julius Caesar passed a law limiting the wearing of pearls to only the ruling class. They were something that were considered the top of the top in terms of jewelry and having that fine aspect. Another example comes from PBS who described pearls as being so valuable that at the height of the Roman Empire, when pearl fever reached its peak, one historian wrote that the Roman general Vitellius financed an entire military campaign by selling just one of his mother's pearl earrings. That's how valuable these were in this day and age. They were sought after and they were highly valued. So in verse 46, we see that upon this merchant finding one pearl of great value, that he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Much like our parable about the treasure in the field, this merchant leverages all that he has, all of his possessions to obtain one thing, albeit a thing of great value. Jesus tells these two parables to convey to the listeners Not a lesson on investments, but a lesson on value. No one would advise you that the best way to invest your money or your resources would be to place everything you have in one spot. No smart investor sells all that they have to buy one stock, no matter how good the stock is. Smart investors will encourage you to diversify your investments, to have them in multiple places in case one doesn't do as well as another. And yet, here we see Jesus is teaching that the kingdom of heaven has such a great value that it is worth everything. Jesus is encouraging the crowds who are present that they must count the cost of following him. And that if they do, if they are willing to count that cost, they will come to realize that the pearl is so valuable and the treasure is so rich that it is worth giving up every earthly possession and valuable that they have. These two parables in our text today provide us with multiple truths about the kingdom of heaven that I believe we can discern from these three short verses. There's five truths that I just want to share before moving on to our next parable. And the first is that the treasure is priceless in value. There is no cost that exceeds the worth of possessing these treasures. Thus, no cost that exceeds the worth and value of possessing the kingdom of God. And the kingdom is not always obvious to see. In these parables, the treasures were hidden. They weren't obvious to one's eyes. 
They had to be found or revealed in order to be possessed. Third, there is joy in finding these treasures. The man who finds the treasure in the field in his joy goes and sells all that he has. So as we find that treasure, the kingdom of heaven, there should be joy in our hearts. And then fourth, people come to these treasures in different manners. We see in the two parables a differentiation between how they found the treasures and the pearl. It shows us that not everyone comes to Jesus in the same way. We have different journeys and paths that the Lord takes us on. I think about even in Scripture the difference between the Apostle Paul who has Jesus revealed to him on the road to Damascus and the Ethiopian eunuch who's searching the Scriptures, who's seeking it out, who's trying to figure out who is this speaking of. Different paths, but they both lead to Jesus Christ. Both find Jesus and ultimately the kingdom through this. And then fifth, there is a cost to the kingdom. These parables are clear to show us that we must uh, be willing to sacrifice, that there is a cost to the kingdom. Not in the way that we can leverage our money and buy our way into the kingdom of heaven. Not in the way that it can be achieved by living a good moral life by doing the right things or saying the right things. The kingdom is only achieved through a saving faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. But there is a cost to following Jesus. The kingdom of heaven, though, is so valuable. Our relationship with Jesus is so valuable that we should be willing to pay whatever the cost in our lives in order to follow Jesus, and in doing so, secure our time and eternity in the kingdom of heaven. Craig Blomberg, to quote him once again, says that Jesus' teachings elsewhere are clear. For many individuals, financial sacrifice is required before other commitments can give way to the priorities of God. And for some, this may require selling all. But for those who do not literally sell anything in becoming disciples, the potential must always be present. They must be willing to risk all if the priorities of the kingdom threaten the security of their earthly existence. You see, there is a cost to following Jesus and a cost to the kingdom of heaven. But it is worth it, is what we see in these parables. That is such a great joy and value in the kingdom of heaven that the cost should be anything that is required. The reality is far too often we see many American Christians willing, unwilling to deeply commit to Christ. And one may wonder, why is this? Why are there so many other things that take priority in our lives over faith, over a pursuit of Christ? Why it would appear often that the most important thing to people does not become their faith in Jesus? And at least one answer lies in the next parable that Jesus tells, which shares that perhaps they don't have a clear understanding of how much is truly at stake in this discussion. Look with me at Jesus' last parable of Matthew chapter 13, starting in verse 47. Jesus continues and says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. And when it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. And so it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This final parable that Jesus tells here in Matthew 13 differs from the previous two. And that does not focus on the one who is seeking, but on the outcome of the end times. Jesus compares the kingdom of heaven once again, but this time, rather than a treasure hidden in a field, he compares it to a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. Jesus uses this symbolism to show us God's gathering of all people at the end of age. The net symbolizes God, who will come in the end times to judge humanity. And the net is described in verse 48 as being full and being drawn ashore to be sorted. And during this process of being sorted, the good is separated from the bad, which the parable tells us is thrown away. The good fish are placed into containers, assumedly for safekeeping, whereas the bad is discarded and thrown away. 
And the good fish represents those whom God has declared as righteous, those who are gathered for further service and safekeeping. But those who are considered bad are those who have rejected God. The parable is tied in with the previous two parables by Jesus starting it with that word again. It links us with the previous two parables and provides a picture of those that failed to give up everything for the sake of the kingdom and are now considered bad and thrown away. Jesus, in verse 49, brings this parable to the reality of the end times, not simply being a parable or a story, but that this is a factual event that will occur at some point in time. And he instructs, saying, so it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous. The call to discipleship, the call to value the kingdom of heaven present in the previous two parables has real-life consequences that we see come to fruition here as they will one day when God comes to separate out the evil from the righteous. In describing the distinction, New Testament scholar Dale Bruner states that the kingdom net, which is far wider than the church, but which includes the church, gathers all kinds. But the kingdom vessel, the coming kingdom of heaven, keeps only the righteous. While the net gathers all, all do not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And so that is what this parable is showing. It's clearly stating that there will be a separation at the end times between those who are considered evil and those who are considered righteous. That God's angels will come and separate those two and that the evil will find themselves thrown into the fiery furnace. Jesus concludes conveying the atmosphere that one will find in this place, stating that there will be a weeping and gnashing of teeth. And what is conveyed by Jesus here is not that one day these two will find their way to heaven or that they will not spend an eternity in a fiery furnace, but th that is clearly what Jesus is saying here. In this description within this text, we see that everyone will face judgment at the end of the ages. The question is not if we will be judged. We will all be judged for our lives. The question is, will we be found righteous thus inheriting the kingdom of heaven? Or will we be found as evil, thus inheriting a place of desolation? The question, though, is not answered according to our standards or by our ability to lead a good life or to be moral in our daily walk. We see multiple places throughout Scripture that all are sinful and that the consequences of our sin is death. That by our own accords, no matter what we do, no matter what kind of life that we live or how much good we do, how hard we strive to be good, that we will never be good enough or righteous enough. The only way in which we can find ourselves on the righteous side is by a saving faith in Jesus Christ. In Romans 10, 9 through 11, the Apostle Paul tells us, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Jesus is clear in our parables today that the value of the kingdom of heaven is so great that this must be our pursuit There is nothing on earth that isn't worth sacrificing for the sake of the kingdom. And one day we will have to stand in judgment for our lives. And if we have disregarded the warnings that Jesus gives us in these texts today and not valued the kingdom and not valued Jesus, not confessed him as our Lord and our Savior, then we will reap the consequences of an eternity separated from him, an eternity in a fiery furnace, an eternity with the weeping and gnashing of teeth. And this may sound grim to you. You may think I'm really being depressing in preaching this. But it is the reality of what we deserve and what we will experience if we are not saved through faith in Jesus Christ alone as our Lord and Savior. And this has an eternal significance. That's why I'm standing up here talking with you about it. It's not because it's easy or fun to talk about. But it's far too often neglected in this day and age in our churches and in our culture. Because it is uncomfortable. It is depressing to think about that. And yet, Jesus gives us that path 
to righteousness. Jesus gives us that path to life and to the kingdom of heaven if we will confess him as our Lord and Savior and thus be saved by what he did upon the cross and in his resurrection. So what can we do? How can we take these warnings from Jesus seriously in our own lives and in our own faith journey? Well, I want to give you three responses to these three parables today. The first is that we would value the kingdom of heaven. We see in these first two parables the great value given to the kingdom, that it was considered so great that it would be worth selling all that one has to possess it. This last week, I was reading an article about a woman who liked to shop at the Goodwill. She liked to go thrift store shopping, and she went into a store one day, and as she was looking around, she saw a vase that kind of caught her eye, and she thought it was pretty, but there were too many people crowded around it. So she walked around the store and didn't find anything worth buying, and then remembered, oh yeah, I saw that vase. I'm going to go look at it again. And when she went and looked at it, she noticed that it had beautiful brush strokes around it, and it had a couple of words on it, and one of them referenced the type of glass it was, which she knew was a nice glass, but there was no price tag on it. And she thought, well, it's probably worth about 8 to $10, so I'll take it up to the register and, and see how much they charge me. They rang it up at $3.99, so she purchased it. And she took it home and asked online if anyone knew anything about it. And it turned out that this vase was uh, from a Venetian artist in the 1940s. It was extremely rare, extremely valuable, and usually would only be found in museums or someone who was very wealthy's private collection. They took the, the 399 vase and they put it up for auction. It went for over $100,000. The woman, after it was all said and done, received about $85,000 from her 399 investment. But the woman did not know the value of what she had until after she did some more research. And once she understood the value of what she had, it changed her life forever. In a much more profound way, we have something of great value that we have been invited into, the kingdom of heaven. And the value is priceless. Jesus gave his life so that we could enter into the kingdom of heaven. The value of the kingdom of heaven comes with many great assets. It comes with the peace that God offers us. It comes with the security in him. It comes with his grace. This is what is offered to us, and it is priceless. But it starts with us valuing the kingdom of heaven and trusting Jesus' words that declare its value. The second element of valuing the kingdom of heaven is that if we truly value the kingdom, then we must be willing to sacrifice for the kingdom of heaven. We've seen in our parable that Jesus deems it so valuable that one should be willing to sacrifice everything in order to achieve it. This reminds me of a prayer from John Wesley that I want to share with you. It's a covenantal prayer. This is what Wesley wrote. He says, I am no longer my own but thine. Put me to what thou wilt. Rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed by thee or laid aside for thee exalted for thee, or brought low for thee. Let me be full, let me be empty, let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartedly yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thou art mine, and I am thine, so be it. In the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. The attitude of Wesley in this prayer is one of embracing sacrifice for the sake of glorifying God. And we too must have that same attitude in our own lives, that we are willing to sacrifice for the sake of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. This sometimes means that we will need to shift our priorities to be in line with the teachings of Christ. We'll have to surrender our idols, to look at our lives and ask if there are things that have our attention or, or our allegiance in place of Christ. Valuing the kingdom, or sorry, sacrificing for the kingdom should lead us to live generously, to not hold our possessions tightly, but to let our generosity point to Christ who will sustain us. And it should even lead us to practice hospitality as a church and as individuals, to be willing to entertain people, to have them over and to sacrifice for fellowship. All of this helps build the kingdom and helps embrace the kingdom of heaven 
here on earth. These practical ways to value the kingdom of heaven and a willingness to sacrifice for it will lead us to impact the lives of those around us for the glory of God. And as you do this, you should have the mindset of a kingdom ambassador, one who represents Christ and points others to him. So my third point would be be a kingdom ambassador. You see, ambassadors can make a big difference. They represent something. They point people to something. Just ask the Stanley brand what an ambassador can do. They've seen a massive shift in the last couple of years, largely due to how they've leveraged brand ambassadors. The Stanley Cup, if you're not familiar with it, used to be a big thermos brand or a brand that people would take to work, uh, that men would use on the job site or people would take to sporting events. Largely, when they looked at their market research, they were geared towards older men is who their primary target audience was and who mainly bought their products. It's a 110-year-old company, but they've revamped their image and their brand. They've used brand ambassadors through social media, people on Instagram and TikTok who have used their products to show others this is a great product, go and buy it. They're ambassadors for them. And what's really funny is they have this one cup that was just one of Stanley's cups and it didn't get a lot of attention. Admittedly, they just kind of said it's one of those off to the side and it's called the quencher. And you've probably seen them. They're a big handled, like 40 ounce cup and they're often in colorful colors and they cost like $45. But what Stanley shifted is they started using ambassadors targeting women and moms in their 20s and 30s. And these cups exploded to the point of last week, people were just showing videos that Target released a special Valentine's Day edition of this cup. Women were trampling each other, trying to get to them and make sure that they got these limited edition cups. They are so popular these days. The senior vice president of global commerce at Stanley, Matt Navarro, said this, he said, this year, Stanley has seen a 275% year-over-year increase in quencher sales and has experienced a 215 increase in its best-selling category of hydration. If we look back over the last six months, we have firmly planted ourselves as the number one drinkware brand in North America. That would not have happened without the ambassadors, without the influencers who are using their products and pointing people to the brand and saying there is a value there. The impact that ambassadors had upon a company like Stanley has been amazing. So the question for us becomes, how can we leverage our influence to be ambassadors for the kingdom of God? How can we use our lives to reflect the truth that we believe in, to become the most effective witnesses that we can be? I believe that this requires us to be authentic and truthful in our lives to promote the things that Jesus stood for, to champion the things that Jesus championed, and to be willing to hold fast to the word of God in all areas of our life. These are a few simple ways in which we can move forward living lives that reflect the kingdom values and share them with those around us on a daily basis. I believe that when we live this way, valuing the kingdom, sacrificing for the kingdom, and being ambassadors for the kingdom— we will see growth in our faith as well as growth in the kingdom of heaven. A few nights ago, I was watching a video with my wife, Amy, and it was an interview of Dave Ramsey. And many of you are familiar with Dave Ramsey. He gives financial advice. He started the Financial Peace University. And he talks about in this video how now that he's older and now that he's well-established and has gone through all his steps and has no debt and has some extra money, what does he splurge on now that he has substantial wealth? And they talk about this quote that Dave has said many times, I guess, which is, if you eat enough lobster, it eventually tastes like soup. Like soap. If you eat enough lobster, it eventually tastes like soap. And Dave continues to talk about how he and his wife love food. They would consider themselves amateur foodies. And that the first time that they had enough money to purchase a chef's tasting menu was amazing. But as they've done it time and time again, it doesn't have the same impact. It's lost some of its luster. And I thought about that in my own life, how thrilling it was the first time I got behind the wheel of a car, 
and got to drive a car as my dad taught me when I was 15. Or the first smartphone I got, how exciting it was, way more exciting than it is now. And you get the idea. Things can lose their excitement. Friends, don't let the excitement about the value of the kingdom of heaven wane over your life. As you hear about God's kingdom, about Jesus' love for you that enables you to experience this, don't let it get old. Value pursuing Jesus and the kingdom of heaven above all else. There is nothing of greater value. There is nothing more worthwhile for you to invest in and to place your hope in. So be willing to sacrifice everything and be willing to pursue the kingdom of heaven through Jesus Christ alone. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for these words that you have given us today, hard as they may be. Lord, may we find encouragement in them, knowing that even in the midst of the challenging words that you have given us the path to righteousness. And so we thank you for what you have done in our lives. We thank you for the grace that you have shown us and continue to show us as you call us to you. Lord, may you continue to guide our lives to reflect you more and more, to make us more like you. And Lord, may we bear witness to who you are to all of those around us in such a way that we see your kingdom expand here on earth as it will be one day in heaven as well. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.